Um, so welcome to the AGTPI workshop, Developing Mobile Computer Vision Applications for Improved Recognition of Livestock. I'm Nicole Scott. I'm the project manager for the Agricultural Genome to Phenome Initiative. Um, and with us today is Josh Peschel. Um, he is, excuse me, the um, Assistant Professor of Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering and Black and Veatch Faculty Fellow at Iowa State University. He also holds courtesy appointments in the Departments of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering. Dr. Peschel conducts research in the area of cyber agricultural systems, where he and his students create new technologies, data sets, and computational models for sensing and sense making. His research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, U.S. Departments of Agriculture, Defense, and Energy, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and a number of commodity groups and private industry partners. And hopefully you've all received um, the, the sort of worksheet um, with the links as sort of your homework coming into here um, to help you get started um, with some of the demonstrations that Dr. Peschel will be conducting. So Dr. Peschel, do you wanna go ahead and take over and get started? Sure, I can, I can try to find my way in the initial part of this, but it's, it's uh, good to be with you all today and to talk about some of these topics that we spend so much of our time doing. Let me see if I can go ahead and share my screen here and get started. Maybe. All right, I'm going to try to watch the chat and do certain things here. Uh, what I'd like to do in the time that we have together today is to spend a little bit of time at the beginning talking about a, a dozen or so little slides that I have that will tell you about where I think that the, the computer vision aspect of some of the livestock industry is right now. And I think that that will lead into us doing some demonstrations with iOS development and then also with multi-platform development. And so rather than waiting for us to have an opportunity at the, at the end of two hours to talk, I'd like to do that more at the beginning, uh, if possible, and then save the time uh, after this to, to go through the code. Uh, presumably we'll get through all of it, but what I'm gonna do is just go in now, let's see if I can find the chat here. Okay. All right. So as far as I know, I'm broadcasting on audio. I'm good. I'm not on mute. I did see one moment there in the chat where maybe somebody couldn't hear us. But Nicole, if you're good to go with me to proceed, I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, it sounds great, but you are not on full screen for your PowerPoint. I will know okay. That. Yeah. No, I'm about to do that. Okay. I'm about to do that. I just didn't, didn't want to miss anything. So uh, when I do go to full screen, I won't be able to see the chat. But what I would like to do is I probably won't take very long to do this. And then I'll uh, use that as a time before we segue into the iOS development. So let's go ahead and do that. So get a little full screen here. All right. So thanks again, everybody, for coming out today to look at mobile computer vision development for applications in the livestock area. As Nicole said, my name is Josh Peschel. I'm assistant professor here in agricultural and biosystems engineering at Iowa State University. My students and I work on a lot of different applications and technologies for areas of agricultural and biosystems engineering where I've spent probably 90% of my time, at least in the last three to four years, has been working in computer vision as applied to animal production systems. And that has spanned across uh, swine, uh, beef cattle, a little bit of poultry, now kind of doing turkeys. And so we've got a little bit of experience in, in everything. And we've been fortunate enough to be involved with the development of some of the computer vision technologies that are, are being used in several different places now. So I'll talk about those more in-place installations of computer vision rather than mobile computer vision, but what I hope to do in the process is to illuminate why, why we might wanna consider mobile computer vision as opposed to more traditional fixed in-place infrastructure. So again, just got about 12 slides here that I'll go through. Um, 
So my background actually wasn't in computer vision. It was in human robot interaction. Uh, so certainly when I came here to Iowa State, and one of the things that I realized very quickly is that we could build all these great platforms to go robotics platforms to go around and do lots of investigations, but it was it was very important for us to be able to well characterize what what we were taking a look at. Um, and so we've done applications in, uh, for example, like measuring water flow on on a mobile device. We've done phenotyping of plants where you measure the stem diameter and the leaf characteristics and all of that. And that that really being in the agricultural space, which was a natural transition over to animal production systems. But prior to being here at Iowa State, it never actually worked, never actually been in an animal production system before. Uh, but that's obviously changed in the last several years. Here are just a few of the examples of things that we had worked on prior to doing that. So where I think I work most is in an area that I've been advocating for, which I would call precision animal science and engineering or PACE. And so historically, Historically, we've had precision livestock farming, which to me has dealt with the more macroscopic characterization of livestock. So for example, uh, ventilation or watching um, animals from a you know, very large scale external perspective herds, or maybe even individuals of anim in individual animals. Um, that really can be compared and contrasted with those who work in animal phenomics. And so where I think uh, and work in the small scale. And so where I think precision animal science and engineering or PACE really falls is at the intersection between a lot of those two efforts. Um, whereas in PLF, precision livestock farming, we've, we've certainly had what you might characterize it as advanced technologies in those areas. Same goes for animal phenomics where you deal with microscopy and such like that, but really to bring a lot of the tools and techniques from one to another, I think that's where PACE is, is focused on. But, but having said all of that, I do find myself a little bit more closely related, even though I have done very small scale things, maybe submillimeter scale type stuff. Probably most of my applications from a practical industry perspective fall a little bit more on the PLF, but, that, but many of those applications have been informed by what we've done at a much smaller scale. We just need to figure out ways in which to implement and deploy that in some of the systems that we're interested in. So where I would characterize PACE today is it would plot, uh, connect a little bit more to that macroscopic visualization of animal production systems. Is it somewhere between where I might say is the yardstick approach and what I might affectionately call the, the internet of pigs. And so the yardstick approach was I think where we were very much so, let's say 10 years ago with crop phenotyping where you would literally send out a bunch of students with uh, yardsticks and do measurements like that. It's not decidedly all that different in animal production systems right now. And there are lots of reasons for that. Um, obviously being able to collect manual measurements that are available, it's cheap, but unfortunately, much like when you're going out and just measuring a single corn plant or a sorghum plant, you're really just getting single point measurements. You're not really getting a holistic measurement. Of the animal. So if you go to the other side of this, of where I think things are at right now, then you're getting more into automated, but perhaps proprietary and expensive costs per data point. Many times they are proxy points. A lot of the technologies today rely on RFID tags and different on animal technologies that might not be the best thing because you effectively have to disturb the animal to get the measurement. There are some measurements like body temperature that might be decidedly more complicated to get if unless you were trying to do some one of those on animal sensors. But I think the thing to think about with that is capturing more, a more holistic visual representation of the animal, you know, both structurally and behaviorally is, is at least the goal of where that is right now. So that's where things I think are at today. And I have a couple of examples of, of applications of computer vision for in-place camera infrastructure where we've looked at. Uh, that's primarily, as I mentioned, being in the swine production industry where you have visualizations of sow crates to look at, for example, the effectiveness of heat lights or other structural changes in the infrastructure to prevent, in this case, piglet crushing. So how can we use piglet, how can we use computer vision to track piglet movements 
to see what's working and what's not from a structural change. And so that's something that, that we've looked at in the past. And you can look at that with regular red, green, blue cameras. You can look at that with Connect, several groups that have investigated that type of activity. And it works pretty well. It's more complicated if you try to do very specific tracking because there are just with anything where there's occlusions, you, you might lose the fact that it's piglet number one, two, three, but certainly you could probably tell at least by process of elimination where all the piglets are. And so in the, on the much larger scale of that, let's say going into grow finish outside of, of let's say a sow barn or farrowing, then being able to actually characterize and track, uh, this is my favorite little Christmas light animation here, being able to characterize and track no matter what the individual animal is doing, whether it's laying, sleeping, standing, feeding, that type of stuff, and then being able to put a more refined track digitally on the animal to get at least behavioral characteristics. Characteristics. So one of the things that we do here is that we extract behavioral time series. Something of interest is let's say with weaning pigs where you might bring them into a finished production facility and some don't eat and that can be problematic. So to know which ones behaviorally aren't eating because you can capture that information over time and know potentially as soon as possible when that's not happening. That is, for example, an application that something like this would, would be useful for. Um, it gets more complicated when you want to do some type of on animal measurement. So if somebody asks me, can I tell within a certain millimeter level precision um, what an, a knee, a joint or an ankle or, or maybe some girth of one of these particular pigs was doing, it gets, a, it gets a little bit more complicated, even with the connect devices to say with any complete certainty what those measurements are. But I think that that type of technology is trending or the, te the technology to do that is trending in that direction, especially when we start looking at devices like the iPhone 12. Um, and there's a couple of reasons I think for that, that I'll, I'll get into here in a moment um, that I'll, when I talk about the, the uh, where I think that the computer vision is going. I also wanted you to realize that it's not quite just limited to being in a fixed position, uh, what we're doing with uh, a finite number of animals. You can also apply these types of techniques to do character or capture and characterization of animals in terms of behavior in more wild type conditions. So please know that what we're doing is not limited to just a fixed position camera. Although that is where I think a lot of the industry is today where you have fixed infrastructure. So where do I think it's really going in the near future? Well, from a perhaps just a business perspective of those companies who are investigating this kind of thing, I guess I'd have a tendency to see what is coming online as more integrated systems. Those are going to be your automated measurements. They will still likely be proprietary. They tend to be a bit on the expensive side, in all honesty. So when we work in production systems, honestly, one of the things that we talk about is, is pennies per pig in terms of cost. And so if you're looking at like $150 per capture of video or installation to capture some of that stuff or to deal with the storage, there's just not really an economic model to deal with that in, in the big picture. For, for industrial applications and for, you know, looking at the broader scale impact yeah, outside of the research community. I mean, we could write a really great grant and develop algorithms and things of that nature. But if you want to have a translation of that technology into industry usage, um, it, it really can't be more than pennies per pig. You're just not going to have that. that that's going to be a barrier to adoption. And that's generally across the board for all of, at least all of the animal production industry partners that I've worked with. The part though that is nice about integrated systems is that you get a lot of feature points. So when we start getting into that conversation of, okay, I want the phenotypical measurements. I want to see how animals are growing. I want to be able to predict weight. That tends to be a hot topic question. Uh, you do capture a lot more with that, but it is still a fixed position location of those cameras. There was probably a reasonably high investment in the infrastructure itself to get the cameras in there. Those of you who work in animal production systems know what I'm talking about when I, I say that it's, it's not the most friendly environment to put any kind of technology whatsoever. 
when I started life out as a researcher, I worked in search and rescue and disaster robotics. And I thought that that was kind of, kind of bad. And the smoke and the fire and the dust and collapsed buildings and all that, and it's bad. But I can't think of a single time where we've done an installation with technology and had it last reliably more than maybe six months because you get corrosion. So service and maintenance is a, is a big deal. In animal production facilities, there's also a lot of cleaning processes that go on necessarily so. And so your technology either needs to be protected from pressure washing or and or needs to be able to accommodate uh, just the levels of humidity, temperature, ammonia gases and different things like that. So the idea that the hardware doesn't matter would be a big limitation in your thinking for the deployment of computer vision technologies and animal production systems. But that kind of gets us to where we are right now in, in this slide and what we're gonna be talking about today. And what I think really needs to be the thing that happens in computer vision for agriculture are mobile computer vision systems, that they be as automated as possible, that they be as open source as possible, but that doesn't mean trade-offs on the ability for the technology to work. And we'll kind of see that when I do the difference between development on iOS platforms and development on open source platforms. The other issue here is that ultimately to make the best kind of decisions, having a richness of data, collecting all the, port, the points that might be possible, not just a set of feature points, might be the thing that leads to the questions that you haven't even thought to ask yet. And that, that is something that might be seen behaviorally um, that, for example, proxy measurements like a, an accelerometer ear tag, you know, you might in a similar way that people try to back out of uh, using machine learning out of homes with smart water meters. Well, what were the people doing with that, with that water based on the signal, the usage signal from the flow rates from the water meter, being able to extract using accelerometers, kind of like the Fitbit for pigs model that they were doing, maybe doing X, Y, Z, or maybe you had an RFID tag so you could get their location, but there's context to everything. And so having the visual data, I think is gonna be really important. The real question is, is how do you do that in a reasonably cost-effective, computationally effective, um, infrastructure-effective way? I, I don't really think it's leaving permanent cameras in facilities. I mean, that's one option, but you have to get around the whole service and maintenance issue uh, also the large collection of data issue. The, the, the direction that I think that it probably goes, which is what I'll be talking about today, which is mobile. But there are some considerations. One very big consideration that we'll see is that you can't just take the model that you've trained up for YOLO 5, let's say, which is a convolutional neural network, and that that would give you a pretty good and reasonably fast if you were running it on your laptop computation for let's say object recognition across a scene of, let's say we we're looking at that pen of pigs and we, you know, we wanted to do the same kinds of tracking or maybe drill down a little bit in the behavioral characterization or something like that. That's probably gonna work fine and at least near real time. I mean, maybe if we're computing on that, we get about you know, one frame processing, maybe a tenth of a second. So if you did every other or every third frame, you can be pretty much real time on that type of thing. But if you chose to then take that model and tried to do it on a mobile device, whether it's Android or iOS, it's not been opt. Well, first of all, it's, it's, it has to be an architecture that could be accessed for, for that particular code base that you're using. But I think secondarily, even if you did get it to run, and we'll take a look at that today, if I took one of my 400, 500 megabyte weights files that goes into the convolution
convolution neural network processing of these image frames that come across in the video, you might get like one frame per second on a 30 frame per second feed. If you're doing anything with motion, you're gonna want at least probably 24, 25 frames per second. In a perfect world, you're gonna want to be able to get closer to 60 if the animals are moving at a fast rate. You wouldn't be, you would just lose them in the track. So those are some of the considerations. And, and probably to summarize it best, models that you may build that may work beautifully on a laptop or a desktop try to put them on the phone or any other mobile devices without being optimized and assuming they work, they, they will not work. And so we have, to, we have to look at, okay, well, how do, we, how do we build mobile models like that? How can we build those into applications? And that's kind of the purpose of the workshop today is to show you how to get started. It turns out that that's actually one of the more difficult things to do is how would you even get started with building an application to do something as simple as, I'd like to recognize a cow in a picture or a, a pig or something of that nature. How do different models perform? How can I even test that? And so that's one of the things that we'll be looking at today, firstly with iOS, and then secondarily with a cross-platform software called Unity that was really a game development software, but it turns out, as ridiculous as it will seem, that there, you can build applications with that. Now, having said that, you could build those in a more native way with some Google technology and Android, I've not found that it's very well documented. So what I'm gonna share with you today are the, the level of detail that you would need to get started for iOS, uh, some examples that would allow you to do it on Android, you'd probably wanna do it on iOS. And then I can point you in the direction of some of the other ones for Android. So there's two things that I would, that I would wanna finish up with here before I get into some of the coding is, is generally in, in what I try to do with my students and in my, in my research in general is to try to expedite, to try to short circuit the processes for being able to do the recognition. So three areas that I generally advocate for in the development of the technology to try to do what it is that we're talking about doing is taking advantage of new camera technologies. So for example, the device that I'll be using today is an iPhone 12, what's unique and special about the iPhone 12, they kind of look all the same. What can they do? Well, what they have started building in are the LiDAR-based sensors on the back. So never before in the history of ever have we had access to computational photography or image processing technologies in the palm of our hand for such, some might not say reasonable, but for a reasonable price. So being able to collect three-dimensional data, for example, if you wanted to, while there are not a lot of resources to be able to do that, Apple does have the AR kit too that you can. If you search around on YouTube, you'll see a couple of examples of that. Um, I'll put one in the notes as well. Um, it, it is going in that direction. Now, Apple put that technology into their phone, not because it would help us out with livestock characterization, but because it would actually have you make better portrait shots with your camera. If the camera can tell where you are in space, it knows how to blur the edges around you and you get better photos. And that's something that they've rolled out generally with the, the night, uh, the, being able to do portrait photos in, at nighttime. Um, because the less illumination that you have, the harder it is to determine computationally where that nice bokeh background might should be, and then your hair gets cut off or something like that. So in the interest of building better selfie you know, cameras and such, Apple has been putting the technology in there. There's also a push to probably more so, but to build up their, their gaming repository where you now have augmented, uh, augmented reality games. And so you can now put your Pokemon figures on your kitchen table by way of using this type of camera. But also, it turns out, you could use that same type of emerging technology to do mobile-based phenotyping if you wanted to. If you could gain access to all of those cloud points, comp compute them efficiently, then you could, in theory, do all that same type of stuff. Now, to the best of my knowledge, 
I believe that, uh, well, and not all iPhones have this, but I think iPhone 12 is the first one to actually have this integrated in. It came earlier on the iPad Pro, so it is on there, and you can have apps. If you had something like that, you could go scan a pig right now if you wanted to in the palm of your hand. No special anything. You could collect that. But the thing to keep in mind is, is that as that becomes more ubiquitous, then, then that's something that could be taken advantage of too. So I don't want us to limit our thinking to just the only the visual you know, red, green, blue spectrum that we see today. It just, it might include a lot more. And, and so that's something that, imagine that being on all cellular phones, that's something that you wouldn't find on all security cameras or actually very, very few. Uh, at best, you probably have something like infrared which kind of has its own problems to begin with. So I think that being able to utilize new camera technologies is something that we've pushed as much as we can on as soon as it becomes available. I think the other thing is being able to, some, an area that, that I won't talk much about today, but where we have worked is being able to fast track recognition. So all of those, you know, all of those pigs and cattle and, and chickens and all of that need to be trained into a model. And there's any number of models that can be trained based on any number of architectures that are out there. And if you work in this area, you know that there's a big fruit salad of, of architectures. And so if you develop the, what are called, let's say the weights file, if you train one, it doesn't immediately translate to the next one. You could use the same training data set and train a different model and then use that. That may or may not work in what you're trying to do and you would need to validate it. But one of the problems as it comes to livestock is really the paucity of really reliable data that would might help you find something. And so rather than spending a significant amount of time out there trying to capture something that might not be maybe even observed from the right direction in terms of like what an animal might be doing, utilizing three-dimensional open source software, uh, one of the software packages we use is called Blender. If it works for Disney, you know, we thought, well, maybe it works for us. And it turns out I had a PhD student work on this and graduated about a year or so ago. We've got the, the papers. At some point, they will finish the review process. We were able to generate those three-dimensional animations and, and then extract from that automatically labeled data that we could then use as much as we wanted, that we could then use to train recognition models, the same kinds of models I'm going to show you today, that would then could then be applied to real video that we might have not had very much of in the first place. So we certainly wouldn't want to take data from it to use for training data that we would have to set aside and not use that in our validation. It turns out that the computer didn't really know the difference. And in some cases, the accuracies were better. And in, in all cases, what we found is we actually had to add a little bit of noise to the, to the model inputs for it to actually produce a, an output that was the most most reliable. So that's the area, the other area is dealing with the either the lack of data or sometimes too much data. So the third thing is trying to focus on developing a lot of our intellectual efforts on, on the software. So as the cameras that I've talked about here briefly become more advanced, being able to translate that across a couple of different things where I think we might see the bottleneck are on the model architectures. So let's say that, you know, Google comes out with a Pixel 6 and it's got that LiDAR camera and we've developed something for Apple. Well, maybe that's a little bit more proprietary on what they were doing, but if there was a model that could be built that was based on, you know, I don't know, let's say YOLO version four and, and, and that might be extensible between the two, right? Versus trying to build some large integrated equipment system that would do something, if I can use Google's camera, if I can use Apple's camera in a similar way and the model can be optimized in some way, then I have a lot of interoperability that I'm able to deal with. The video is the video. So what happens after you capture it, that's probably a whole nother story. The things that I'm talking about are what happens when we're effectively trying to do it in real time. And uh, for producers, for people who evaluate animals, for veterinarians, oftentimes it's wanting to look at something in, in real time. So I would probably make that note that we might want to uh, consider the nature of what you're looking for 
informing what what probably the the capture would be. So the 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 last thing I'll say here, if I can get to the slide, is now that we're doing this, if we have this you know big Cambrian explosion of of computer vision on all these mobile devices, uh, if we if if we trend in the direction that a lot of human activities have as it would relate to mobility coming into play, whether it's automobile travel or airplane travel or, or just the development of life in general, um, we'll then have computer vision type technology on all the mobile phones. And certainly we, we do to some extent when we start talking about facial recognition and all that kind of stuff. But when you talk about agricultural production systems, whether it's crop or in particular in livestock production systems, the data itself, like with many things, are the commodity. But there are also concerns. One area that we're looking in right now is deep fakes as it relates to animal videos. Okay, so the questions that we have and that we like to think about are really who owns those data of the livestock animals? Specifically, you know, is it a is it a genetics company? I mean, who has the most vested? Is it the person that paid the bill? Largely, a lot of times. Um, and then, how private will it be? Um, where does it get kept? That kind of stuff. Um, but those questions come up when we start talking about open source. And then, secondarily, if we do have these data, what effectively does that do to the operational supply chain along the way, where you have I mean, you, you may have in many cases like vertical integrators, but let's say that you have uh, two companies that are working for together and all of a sudden I'm, I'm a larger company that deals with the, the um, more end of the supply chain and I'm paying a producer for his his or her barns, you know, maybe I'm involved with the feed or something like that. And then I have these data that I can very, very precisely know how those animals were grown in a, in a way that would be similar. The large food companies will, will pay corn producers, for example, uh, to grow corn, certain varieties, certain ways, certain methods, certain things like that. Um, in, in a way that was maybe analogous if I went and stuck a camera out there at the cornfield. Right? You understand something fundamentally different about the supply chain if you have this kind of information. And what would that do to um, you know, working back up the chain in terms of how it may be perceived or expectations or something like that? So just because we can do it, it, it might lead to a hardship for people you know, back upstream in supply chain. And then I think the third thing alludes back to what I talked about at the beginning with related to, let's say, the defects, and that's how are we going to ensure the integrity of the data? It's very easy for me to fake a, an, an injury, well, let's say, on an animal or something like that. And that five-second clip out of the, outside of the context of what it, what it might be talked about in general um, might, might be bad, you know, if that was talked about in nefarious ways. And that, you know, that kind of happens as it is. And so... You know, how do you, how would you differentiate the, something that would not be, would either be taken out of context visually now that you have that? And how, how would you even minimize or let, deal with the fact that it was, if it, if it were, you know, a fake? I mean, we see this on Twitter all the time. There was something that came across yesterday that somebody had faked an image. And you have to have every major news organization go out there and dispute it. What is it if it's a production unit and, and there's been something that's been faked? It looks 99% real, but the one thing it's, it's off. So how would you be able to differentiate that? And I think these are three areas of concern as we talk about these technologies that 
we, I think we would be deficient in considering the big picture if we didn't have those, those areas of concern well addressed before you start putting cameras in everybody's hands in a way that exists beyond putting permanent infrastructure installations in where you could at least control the view. And now the view can go anywhere. And we work really hard on making the process recognize what it's seeing as best we can, but ultimately the result of that might, might you know, need to be looked at in terms of its validity and uh, certainly the security of the, of the facility that's being investigated. I think that, that I could very confidently and safely say that that would be a chief concern among anybody who works in the livestock production industry that that data not be misused. I'll just say it like that. So having said all of that, I, I'm going to get set up to share with you the iOS development for our first application. It's going to seek to utilize the camera on an iPhone and uh, deploy a standard machine learning model. And then we're going to put some pictures of some animals up on my iPad, and we're going to test out a couple of different models for doing that. But before I do all of that, um, and as I'm getting set up, I would welcome any questions or discussion as it would relate to the big picture of why I'm even talking about what I'm talking about um, in, the, in, in the programming of what we're doing today. So if you want to drop that in the chat, maybe that's the easiest thing. And now I'm stuck in my slides. Okay. We can do that. And what I may do here is just share my desktop. We'll get all the things. All right, so I'm ready to start the iOS development. We've got, we've got the uh, Apple device running. Clearly it's picking up my voice from that. It's not recording, so no problem there. So I'll use this, I'm broadcasting this from my iPhone that I have connected to my Mac laptop here. So what I'm gonna do in, in this lesson, and I'm not seeing any questions come across, but I'm always happy to, happy to take questions after too. Uh, we'll see how far we get with this iOS development. I've got a couple of demos. I know I think we'll be able to get through all the iOS. I've got a couple of demos that I can show you if we run short of time in the cross-platform development. Um, that's what I'll make available as the code. I did want to show you how you'd set up some initial screens with that and then probably push the button on some demos so you know we can see the camera. And the big thing I wanted to show you on that demo was how the uh, the, the I'll try to turn that off. How the um, the frame rates change. I mean, that's the big thing. When you go with a non-optimized model, it's going to really just drop off the bottom. So let's see. So I've got Xcode going. Still no questions. So I'm going to try to stick this over out of the way, and we'll go back into Xcode here. So I had a little bit of introduction, and I might, since I'm kind of blasting out everything on my desktop, I think what I'm going to do is drop my camera feed because I was mentioning to Nicole earlier that uh, the, the, the Wi-Fi that I was on might be a little bit spotty. Also, this may be a whole lot of me squinting at the screen to make sure I've written the right code as we go through here. So I'm still here. And what I'll be sharing with you is just here on my desktop. So, so I've got Xcode in the preparatory material. What we had was if you're using a Mac device, then you would need to get Xcode. You don't necessarily have to have a developer account. Um, if you wanted to put it on a device, it would. Uh, you would need that, but you don't actually need that. And so in this activity, what I'm gonna take you through is actually the full cycle of, of starting a new project and 
going through and adding a view to that and then adding all of the necessary code um, with the level of detail that you would be able to um, you know, start the application, show the video, and incorporate a, a, a machine learning model to take advantage of the computer vision capabilities that are integrated into Apple's iOS right now. And we'll test it out and have a little bit of fun with it. And as I'm getting started here, the thing that I would tell you is that we do spend probably most of our, I feel like I'm going to be given an Apple commercial here, but there's a reason why we use it. And it's because it just, the hardware wise, it's the software and the models and stuff are very optimized for what we want to do. So if we want to blast away at 30 frames per second and process is real time, as I'll show you another demo after the one I built here, um, it works really well. So that's, uh, that's generally why we use it. And that's why I'm going to be showing you that first. I understand that that's, it's, it's not an open source thing, but that's why we use it. So, so I've got Xcode loaded up here. And so what I'm going to do is just start from scratch here. So I'm just going to go and I'm going to open a new project file. So I just go file and new, and we're going to open a project. And you get a lot of choices. So obviously we could develop for any number of, of iOS or Apple devices from the computer that I'm using in Mac OS. You do stuff for the iPad under iOS, watch OS if you're, or if you're into the watches and the sports or even your television. So there's a lot of different templates here. The one that we're going to be using is just the app. So I'm gonna se select that and we'll go next. And then uh, we'll just call this our AG2PI app. And um, so I've already got my uh, credentials and stuff set up for my Apple developer account to be able to deploy. So um, under your team, normally it would just be something like your Apple ID. As far as the interface goes, so this is the part that I'll have to tell you that I'm guessing. So you're going to use Storyboard. Storyboard has been around for quite a few years. allows you to do basically just that if you wanted to build your screens the things that you see and touch your interfaces if you want to storyboard them out you can programmatically code things like buttons and video and model and all that kind of stuff uh, you could do it while still using storyboard apple is moving towards what's called swift ui where a lot of those um where a lot of everything is dealt with programmatically, there are still some major limitations with doing everything in Swift. The current version of Swift, I think, it, which is Apple's programming language, or it's just a programming language in general, uh, that you could do for many more things besides iOS. I think we're at about like 5.5 or 5.6. Um, that's the programming language. But as that language evolves, I think you would be more likely to see in iOS development something under Swift UI. For today, we're just going to pick Storyboard. I will show you what happens on the storyboard, but we're actually going to do everything programmatically. So um, here, there's really nothing to change other than the, the UI kit. And then if you're from the old school, you'll remember that everything more or less used to be done in Objective-C. And if you're familiar with C programming, then this was effectively um, Apple's version of doing certain type of C programming. So let's say, for example, when I did my dissertation work about a decade ago when I was building robot interfaces on iPads, everything was OpenCV, even, um, or sorry, Objective-C. OpenCV was like, had barely just had its, had been compiled so that you could use it with Objective-C and you still had to do a lot of, uh, a lot of tumbling to try to get it to work. So for the most part, this is basically all you have to do to set up a new project. So We'll click storyboard and we'll, we will use Swift because we, we're not going to dip into any OpenCV, any type of thing to that with that today. Let's just go ahead and click next. And then what I'll do is I'll just save it 
um, you would have the option of putting in like in a Git repository. I'm just going to go ahead and save this to uh, my desktop. And it's going to go ahead and build a build a project. And now it's pretty much ready to start editing. I'll go ahead and move this uh, Safari out of the way because we'll come back to that when we when I show you where to get current machine learning models. So just kind of walking around the application here, um, the project file that goes into the directory that kind of contains everything here and that has a lot of all the parameter settings and the, we'll look at the signing capabilities and all of that. So the page that you're probably going to care most about are, are, are these pages that I'm going to show you here. So you can, for example, deploy on an iPhone or an iPad. You could deploy for any previous iOS version. I'll just go ahead and uncheck that. You can even, for example, change the device orientations. I'll go ahead and turn off landscape. The, what that effectively does is it requires that your phone only stay in a portrait mode if you've had that, that lock that you turn on to prevent it from going sideways, because maybe then your email app does all weird things. I'll just go ahead and turn that on since I'm here. And these are some of the settings that you could spend all day talking about all the settings. But those are some of the main ones. You could change your versions here and all that good stuff. Another item of note is if you were, um, sometimes if you get a, um, uh, like if you're working with multiple people, you might have a different team that you might choose. And if you're trying to upload to the app store, you might have a different bundle identifier. Uh, so for example, I have, a, an Apple development certificate. So this is already signed. Just be aware that if you don't have that, that's not a deal breaker, but it just might not have anything there. And if you try to deploy it on a, on a device, you may run into some problems. And so there are some other things that I would never touch <laughs> that are out, like for example, in the build settings um, that are related to the compiler and things that you're really not gonna care about, you're not gonna wanna touch. And so that's just showing you a few things that are, that are on that main project page. There are then the files that are associated with a, a project. And so there, there are lots of different files that can go into an application depending on which type of application that you chose to develop. For example, if we had chosen a game template, there might be some different files in here. Some of these files in just a standard app, like for example, if I click on it, they're not, we're not gonna do anything with, this is all kind of behind the scenes stuff. And if I had chosen core data, which relates to saving data and stuff like that, some of this gets put in here by default and we'd never touch that. Or you'd only touch it if you were gonna be doing something very specific. Likewise on the scene delegates, what we're going to care most about is working in the view controller. It is also the code where you had the least population of, of automatic code for you. And we're going to be using that today when we get started. The main storyboard has on it, and I'll kind of spread this out. So this is where you can put all of your view controllers. You could do multiple versions of what would be appearing as a scene. Now, the advantage is using something like a main storyboard is that you can choose the different device that you're developing on. So for example, like today I'm using iPhone 12 Pro, but if you said, well, hey, Josh, I wanna develop for the iPhone SE second generation, that option is there too. And you'll see that what it does is it changes the, the view or the display. So when you're doing your layouts for your design of your apps, this is one of those things that comes into play that, that you would wanna do. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put it back because I've got the iPhone 12 and I've got a notch. Now, it, if I didn't change it back and I write my code and I compile everything, it's probably gonna be fine. But, but if you were doing multiple storyboards here, multiple views and your screen resolution, so for example, might be different. I mean, as you know, if you work with iPhones, stuff like that, the screens are different sizes and over the years. And so if you, laid out everything to be on an iPhone 12 Pro Max, which is like a gigantic phone, and you try to run that on an iPhone 6, stuff might be cut off, stuff might look weird, and it might be scaled. This is the way in which you deal with all of that. So even though we're doing everything programmatically, that's why storyboard is, is important. And you can do things like segues, you could kind of 
do a little bit more drag and drop stuff as it relates to buttons and, and things of that nature. But the, the, the key thing here is really the view controller. And this is what we're going to be working on. So today, we're only just going to be doing a single view controller such that when we open the application, it's going to present us with the camera. Now, that's not going to happen until we tell it some things. But, but in general, you know, you, you know, with any application, you might have like three or four screens deep that you might go to. Well, this is where you, where you visualize, where you add elements like labels and buttons and video portals and tabular strips and any kind of element that you could think of switches, sliders, all of that stuff can be, just be dragged and dropped onto this. And then you program it and then you can update it and do all those great things. So that's why storyboard's important. Swift UI is coming. I'm not entirely sure. I don't obviously work for Apple, so I don't know how they're going to deal with that. But what I do know is under Swift UI, you can't do things as readily as you can with the current versions um, which is to say, if I wanted to present the camera, extract the frames and things like that, I, at least I don't know how to do it. And I've not seen a way to do it. So we're going to jump into the view controller here. And that's going to be, this is going to be the code behind that scene that I just showed you right there. I've only got a single view controller, but there's nothing in it right now. So let's put some things in it. So just a, uh, just a bit of, of of information on what we're seeing here, there's not much code. So we have in Swift UI and for iOS, we have what's called object oriented programming. Some parts of that look like procedural programming if you're familiar with Python. Other parts look very weird and different as we'll see. But the idea behind object oriented programming is the class is treated effectively like a blueprint. You can connect it to other classes that are effectively blueprints and you work with objects, for example, like a button object or a machine learning model object. And those objects have properties and they have methods associated with them. And when I say methods, I'm really talking really mostly about what you might think of as a function. And so we can have those objects do things. Like for example, when I create a button, I can deploy a method that adds that button specifically to the view that I want to see. So that's what we're dealing with when we're dealing with Swift UI. Now, we have obviously our class. The class's name is View Controller. It is of the type of UI View Controller. And that class is named as the same that that class is named as the same name as the uh, as the as the view controllers, so the file name is the same thing as the class name. That's the thing to keep in mind. Inside the class is going to be our series of functions. So always populated with the 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 basic class is going to be our view did load. And if you're a programmer with C. C sharp, or if you've done other things, or just maybe no C in general, a lot of times you'll have, let's say, your main function or the thing that happens when that when that code gets called. So anything that happens that gets put into view did load is going to happen when that screen pulls up or that view control or that thing, that interface that I showed you. Now there's a second function called view did appear. And I think maybe in C sharp, if I remember correctly, that's called uh, maybe like a refresh or view refresh. And so that's something that might get run over and over and over separate from view did load. But the thing to think about it is that when view did load, when that when the view did load, then whatever you put in there to to have happen will happen for sure. Your other functions will go outside of this. Uh, you could call those functions from inside view did load. You could actually even extend this class if you wanted to. You could inherit from other classes into this class, and we'll actually see that when we, when we go through. But for right now, let's go ahead and have as our, our initiative the ability to show the camera on the iPhone, and then we'll ultimately see how to connect and get the data coming from the camera, and then we'll apply that to a model. So as it stands right now, we have uh, just UI kit. This is a, 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 an API or a, you think of as a library of available functionality. 
that comes in. And so what we need to do when we start uh, adding some things are uh, to add some more libraries. But let's go ahead and let's look at one more thing here. Um, I want to show, maybe I need to go this. So what I'd like to do to just demonstrate of when something will run, if it's inside this primary function here, let's just drop a little print statement here and we'll look at that in the console. And I'll show you that's the other thing is to is to where, yeah, this debug area, activate console. So that's the other part, it doesn't default. That's what I was missing. I was like, where'd my console go? So if we just drop a little print statement in here that says, you know, the view controller has loaded. So as I said, everything that happens inside of view to load gets called as soon as that, that loads up. So if I go ahead and run this, this is my console. So this is where I get the text feedback. So when I go ahead and run this, what should happen is it should print here view did load because what we'll see over here come up on the phone is that application. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at that. Just a very simple first step here and then we'll add all the more complex stuff. So we have a build succeed, everything is right. And it takes a moment to initially get on the phone and nothing is happening over here. It's just a blank screen because we haven't put anything here. But what we do know is we've jumped into that view did load function. And so we get a single line here that says the view controller has loaded. So we have a complete success getting started with our application here. All right, so we'll pause that out. And uh, so we've confirmed that our application will compile and it will compile to the phone. And it will, you know, do the thing that we need to do. So let's start up with then the idea of getting access to the camera. So when that view controller loads up, I want to see the camera automatically. It's going to take a few steps, though. So let's go ahead and we can comment out with two forward slashes the, the print statement that we put in there. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create our own function to start up the camera. And we could technically put this inside, all inside view did load. But what I'd like us to do is to think about keeping things separate. So let's go ahead and write this function that starts the camera and we'll just continue to add to it. So to do so, we'll just type func start my camera. Make sure we're spelling everything right. And then so we'll put some brackets on it so that we have scope for our function. Now, this function that we're going to write here has going to have three different main parts, and I'm going to walk you through it. I mean, this is the stuff that's like not really available online, so it's really hard to know. That's why I picked this one, because it's hard to know where to start to even, how do I show the camera? How do I grab frames out of the camera? How can I apply the model? How do I do all that? I'm convinced everybody can figure out how to build a model, but to get the data to actually work in real time is a whole different complicated thing. So we're gonna have three parts in this function. The first one, we're gonna just say this is part one. And um, in part one, we're gonna do what's called our AV capture session configuration and running. And this is really gonna be four steps for us. So an AV capture session is really the foundation for all of the media capture in all of iOS, macOS, and things like that. And what an AV capture session is, like an audio video capture session, is it manages the application that you're building, its access to the operating system's capture infrastructure, specifically like the camera, and it's a camera capture device. This is going to vary per phone. Per phone. Um, and it also allows you to interact with and manage the flow of data from the input devices, like there are several different cameras on the phone. Um, and then also to the different media outputs. So in doing that in our AV capture sensor configuration running, really our first step is going to be uh, specify our AV capture session. And to do that, I've already described it. So let's just say let uh, my capture session 
and we'll set that equal to an AV capture session. So we'll just construct it right there. And we're going to get an error. Now, the reason why we're getting an error is because uh, nine times out of 10, when you know you add a keyword of something, it's because you haven't imported the right API. So while we're using defaultly the user interface kit, which would give us access to things like buttons and labels and all that kit, that stuff, what we haven't done is we haven't imported our AV kit. And when I do that, what should happen is you'll see two things. All of a sudden my keyword here goes to a different color and the red squigglies go away. So that's, if you run into errors, that's probably where the first thing was, is you don't have the right API called up. In this case, it was AV kit. Um, yeah, pretty much that. Now you're gonna see that another error popped up here and it's basically saying that my capture session was never used. One of the things, I have sort of a love-hate relationship with the Xcode SDK because, <laughs> I mean, a lot of these messages, you'll just say, I know. I know I've not used it yet. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that. And so um, we can ignore that for now. Uh, if you get to the end of your code and you're still getting error messages, that's when you sort of have to start troubleshooting. But for now, we've just specified our first, you know, our variable, our first variable, and we specified it to construct an AV capture session, which will now, which is really the basis for everything that we need to start doing for showing the camera. So that's the first step. So step two then, is uh, my apologies every time someone tries to join it re for some reason takes over my keyboard and it starts doing weird stuff but uh so the second step is going to be specify the capture device all right so this is where we start getting into looking at uh the cameras on the phone and so to specify an av capture device the AV capture device is an object that gives us an input. And that could maybe be a camera or a microphone. You know, we haven't really talked about that at all, but you can choose to or not capture audio too, if you wanna do something like that. And that's gonna be for capture sessions, these AV capture sessions. And what it does is it really offers you control for hardware specific capability features. So if we just come down here and we say, uh, let my capture device, and we'll set that to an AV capture device. You'll see that the nice thing about the Xcode SDK is that it gives you auto-completes and it fills in arguments and things like that. So let's see, what else do we need? We need to go ahead and call that a default and four, and we're gonna be doing a video. So we wanna set our argument for that. Um, it's probably going to say that it's never used. And the other thing that I probably want to do is I probably want to guard that. So I'm going to use the keyword guard here. And I'm going to put an else. And you could put a lot of different things in what would happen if, if you didn't have a capture device, but I'm just going to return. So the reason why I did this is um, if you've ever done programming, you try to do try catches and things like that, which I'll put in there. It guards against setting a variable equal to something that doesn't actually exist. So you could put print statements if you're trying to debug and do different things like that. When I create this variable for my capture device and I set it equal to an AV capture device and I specify it defaultly for the video camera that's available on that camera, if, for example, that doesn't exist, maybe the hardware is broken, or maybe you compile it to, let's say, I'm just making this up, uh, like an iPod. For how, however you did it, let's say you got it on an old iPod Touch or something, and maybe there's no camera. Well, that's going to cause a problem. And so where you guard against here and just do a simple return is if that was not the case, so then you basically dump out of the program. And so uh, you could do something more complicated by uh, like put like a print statement in there and say, I, the capture device not available, something like that. Um, for, the, for the purposes of sort of brevity, I'll just return out of all of these, but that's actually a pretty good programming practice when you work with object-oriented programming, that if the camera was not available for any reason, maybe another application, 
had logged onto the camera and you had that application running in the background, th that's just something that you want to do. And I'll try to remember to do that as we go through with uh, all the other variables that would relate to devices that would be, or inputs that would be, you know, uh, potentially not available or occupied that you would get a weird exception or an error and it would be very hard to debug. So let's look at step three. Step three is going to be specify and add the capture input. So now that we've specified the capture device, what we want to do is to be able to add that to our AV capture session. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll uh, do a guard since we're going to practice some good habits. So we're going to let a guard and we're going to say my input. So that's going to be our input, the capture input. And then we'll go ahead and do a try. And then it's a AV capture device input and our device is going to uh, be my capture device because I've already specified that as my capture device. And what else do I need? Oh, I need a return, I need an else and I need a return. So that is going to now give me an input that I have from that capture device so specified. And then I actually needed a cat to add that formally to my AV capture session. So I'm going to have another uh, line of code here that basically is my, or sorry, capture session. And then we're going to add the input. And then that input that we're going to add is my input. So I've instantiated a capture session. I've designated the, the, the camera as my capture device. I've specified it as an input, and then I've added that input to my capture session. Okay. Now, what I can do at this point is I have a reasonably functional function here, pun intended, um, but it doesn't really do anything because it's not called from anywhere. So what I could do is come up here and say, all right, I'd like to, when view did load, gets called up let's go ahead also and then run our function start my camera so whatever's in this function here that i've specified av capture session have a capture device inputs and i've added that to the session that's going to get called when view did load comes up so let's see let's just make sure that everything is good to go and we'll go ahead and uh, uh, you'll see the template over here already from the previous run of this for my AGTPI app, I haven't given it an icon or anything like that, but uh, uh, I won't delete it, but it'll basically write over it when I choose to compile it. So we'll make sure we save, hadn't done that yet. So I'll go ahead and compile it. And I'm, I'm gonna be looking for a couple of things. I'm gonna be looking at, do I have, do I actually have the camera yet? And you know, does it, does it do anything else that I needed to do? Well, we're th throwing an error here. And this is the a very good error to know. And I threw this on purpose because let's take a look at this error. So this is a very Apple thing that you may not find with other devices. So privacy is a big deal at Apple. And so what the error has here is this app has crashed because it attempted to access privacy sensitive, privacy sensitive data without a usage description. So what we need to do and what it tells you that you need to do is you need to go into the apps info.plist and we must put in a camera usage description key with a string value that basically tells the user what's going on here. So I'm gonna hit stop over here. And what I'm gonna do is come up and uh, show you back in the branch where we had the plist. That's the file that, I, that's the other file that I didn't talk about. So the plist, the info.plist, that's the information property list. And there's a lot of stuff in here already, but because privacy is a big deal at Apple, things like your location, things like your camera, things like recording, recording your audio, all of that stuff has to be prompted to the user and permission given. Anytime that app is run initially, if it's the user has done it, then it's okay. But let's go ahead and scroll down and add in that really key missing thing about privacy. So cat privacy, camera uses description is what we want. If you're doing other things related to privacy, you can see there's a ton of stuff. Let's say you were doing like location usage description. 
If you were going to give away your location, you would need to have one of those. Uh, there's probably an audio or microphone one. Yep. So microphone uses description. If you were also recording audio with your video, you need to additionally have an entry for this one. But for what we're doing right now, we're just going to have our camera. So we just need a camera usage description. And what I'm going to do here is now, so I added that in, that's here. And then I'm going to put a, a, a value in for the key. So our key is our privacy camera use description. And what I'm going to say is our AG2PI app needs to use your camera. And that's it. That's, that's pretty much it. That's all you pretty much have to do. Now, this message here, this value for this key in this property list is going to be displayed to the user as part of an alert. So what I want to do is go back here to my view controller with my code. Everything was still look good. You know, a cat didn't jump on my keyboard and change anything here. So I'm going to try to, for all intents and purposes, I should be able to run this again. And what it should do is make sure that time, as so I don't get the privacy error, but what I should get is a prompt that the app is wanting to use this input, the camera. Uh, may not fully work yet, but we'll see what that looks like. So now what we see here is that The app would like to use the access of the camera. And this string here is what I put in there. Now I'm doing this on my computer. I have to actually physically do it on the phone. I'm just mirroring the phone. Now, if the, somebody picked don't, don't allow, then it's going to fall apart, right? You would need to deal with that in the code. For the tense and purposes today, we're just going to go ahead and click OK. All right. So, uh, but nothing happens. And that's OK because you know, we crossed a big milestone, which is there is, is, is dealing with the privacy. If you had not done that, you cannot deal with the camera and do what we need to do. So that error now goes away and, and, and we got our prompt to approve the access to the video camera. That'll stick as long as that app uh, it remains on that device. If we write new code and update it as we're doing now, it, 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 if, or if I were, to, I'm sorry, if I were to delete it, then it would ask me again. And again, this is going to apply for photo as access, video, microphone, location, any of that stuff. And so really at this point, what you might be asking is, well, where's the camera? We still haven't seen the camera yet. Um, we've given permission, but we can't see it. And so what we need to do is make a few mo more modifications. We've done what I would consider sort of like part one here, which is adding in or setting up our AV capture session and configuring it. And then, uh, um, oh, I do need to add one more. Sorry, I was getting ahead of myself here. Need to stick to the script. So we want to go ahead and start the AV capture session. And now you know that you we can prompt for permission without starting the AV capture session. So the last thing that we need to do is go ahead and start the AV capture session. So we'll do a my capture session and we'll do a start running. And that's all you need to add for that. And that's the fourth step of the first part of three parts. And the subsequent parts are going to have less parts. But that's the first thing that you need to do to get an AV capture session set up and running. So now we'll go into part two. And we need to be able to add the camera output to the app display. That's, that's kind of the thing that we're missing. We can run it. We get kind of this. Um, I'll just go ahead and do that. And we'll move that back over. Um,
we'll go ahead and add our part two. And what that's going to be is add our camera output to app display. And that's going to be two steps. So the steps get less now. I can type today. Been a long day. All right. So our first step of two is going to be defining the preview layer. And in the preview layer, so we're going to put in a new kind of long word here, which is uh, we're going to add an AV capture, a capture video preview layer. That's part of the core animation layer that is basically displays video as it's captured. It's a subclass of what's called the CA layer, which allows you to do like drawing and animation, all those great things that you can do on a screen. And, and it's, you know, the CA layer effectively manages any of the image based content and allows you to look at to, to, to do animations on the screen. So in our first step, what we want to do is we're going to do a let my preview layer. So we're going to add a preview layer equals AV capture sorry, video preview layer all the way at the end there. And for our session, we know our AV capture session that we've already specified is my capture session. So we've got that. So that's our first step. And obviously it's telling us that we haven't used it yet. And thanks, Xcode. So then we have, we want to go ahead and add the preview layer. Um, to the view controller view. All right. So then to do that, we just need to add one line of code. So we'll do a view. Since we're just dealing with a single view controller layer, um, it's actually a subclass of layer. So we'll do a view dot layer dot add sub layer, and then the layer that we're going to be adding that as told you was already a CA layer. That's going to be my preview layer that I've already put. So that should give us a little bit more. Let's go ahead and see what that gives us when we go ahead and compile it. We're not getting any errors. And we don't have to get prompted again for the thing, but we still don't have a camera. And the reason why we still don't have a camera is that we need to specify a frame for the preview layer that we just added. And by that, I mean like a, a frame that the, the camera frame can go to. So we're gonna actually add, we'll, we'll just, we'll, we'll include this on step three. So here we just need to say my preview layer dot frame is going to be equal to view dot frame. Now I'll go ahead and save this and then I'll hit compile and you should then see my office. So we have a working camera being broadcast to a view controller now with about six or seven lines of code here, right? And so, you know, we've got, you know, all the good stuff. I don't know if it's going to do funny things if I shine the display into the, the display, but, you know, for the most part, now we're in business because we've got a camera built into the view layer. So we're good to go. So now we need to do a couple more things because uh, we need to get access to the data that's coming. So we got a small celebration here. Uh, but we're really kind of only two parts of the way there in our overall build. And so we've got our camera displaying, but we don't have it connected yet to a recognition engine that would be able to process our camera feed that we're seeing and then tell us about something about the objects that are, might appear in the video. And this is actually where the most new stuff from Apple comes in, the Apple Vision API. So what we need to do is I'll go ahead and... and and just drop this in since I've I forgot about it before. We're going to add one more API here, which again is a reasonably new one. So we're going to add the Vision API, and this is going to allow us to connect to those great machine learning models that I'll show you how to get access. I've got a couple of downloaded here on the on the website or on my desktop here, SqueezeNet and ResNet 50. And anybody that's done anything with uh, CNNs and such would uh, that should probably be familiar names too. We'll put those in our models, but I'll show you where they came from and I'll show you where you can get other ones. And I'll show you where you could even, um, you know, build your own. 
So we've got that in so we don't forget it. And let's go ahead then, we've done our first part here, we've done our second part here. Let's go ahead and jump in and get this last part. So part three, and that's gonna be, uh, we wanna gain access to the camera video data. Looks awesome on the screen, can't do anything with it right now. So this one really just has one step. So our step here is to specify and add the capture device output. And here we're going to be invoking a, what's called an, an, an AV capture video data output, similar to like what we did with the AV capture uh, inputs and things like that. Um, it's it, it, an AV capture video data output allows you to record video and it gives you access to those video frames that you can do processing with. And so you use this output to process to either compressed or, or you could have uncompressed frames uh, from the video that gets captured with the camera. So, so what we're gonna do here is we're going to um, put in a couple of lines of code in this step. So we're gonna have a let my data output and we're gonna set that to an AV capture video data output. We'll construct that and then we'll go ahead and uh, add another line of code where we're gonna need to uh, do what's called setting the sample buffer delegate uh, to associated with a, a, a queue. So a queue you can think about is like a, if you're um, like a, a thread. And so um, in, in applications, you've got, let's say like an iOS application, you got like a main thread and you wanna run all your stuff on, and you'll actually get errors if you try to run stuff off the main thread. But we're gonna create a queue here or a thread that, that we're gonna just name something that we want to name it associated with that data output. So let's do a my data output dot set sample buffer delegate. And it's going to give us some information here, how we can populate that. We'll do a self. And then for the queue, we're going to specify that as a dispatch queue. And that's going to have an expectation of a label. And what we're just going to call it for fun is just my video queue. And then it's closed out. So therefore, we've got a good setup here. Uh, let's see, what am I missing? Yeah, that's I wasn't missing anything. What is that? Ah, OK. So this is where I need to inherit from another class. So what I can do is I can add the missing conformance, AV capture video data output sample buffer delegate. It gets added up to the top where we had a UI view controller. So if I do this, if I click fix, and this is one of the nice things that Xcode allows you to do, it helps you from stepping in holes. I can add, I can go ahead and click fix. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna add the AV capture video output outputs, sorry, a lot of words today. AV capture video data output sample buffer delegate to be inherited from into this class. But what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna add, we're gonna need to add one more function in there. That's okay. But because I want to do something with the set sample buffer delegate, I needed to add that such that it would be recognized and be useful in this application here. So I need one more line of code here. Uh, my capture session, and we want to add the output to that capture session that we already have started. And then it's going to be my data output. All right. So I mentioned having to do one more functional addition. For the most part, we've got all the code that we need. to. we have our inputs, and we have our outputs, and we have our AV capture sessions. Um, we need a way in which to monitor the data to make sure that it's coming to us. And to do that, that's where the sample buffer delegate comes in. 
And so when we do this, we need to actually make a simple separate function that's going to be required. And it's called a delegate method. And it gets called every time the camera is about to capture a frame. And so then to add this, we want to add this separately. So we'll do an, a function capture output. And uh, we'll see if I click too soon. I think that most of this stuff has already been populated by the arguments um, that need to be in there. But this actually needs to be a did output. And then our sample buffer, our CM sample buffer, that's correct from connection, AV capture connection. And then it's just going to tell me I need to. So I actually hit the tab too, too far. That was another option to where uh, did output. So what we want to do is this is our second little delegate or second function that we're dealing with. And it's our delegate method. So we can, we can test this out to see what it actually does with just a simple print statement, like what we were doing before. And remember, this is kind of like a data handler. So when this gets called, it gets called every time the camera is about to capture a frame. So logically, if that's the case, I should be able to then do something like print the time that it was captured. So before we start passing these data to a model, let's just make sure that it can do, and then we'll do date. It'll give us a date and time. So what we should get is a feed from the camera and then the ability to go in and or, or at the same time in the console. So we'll turn that on. So we'll show, show our debug area, activate console. So we have our debug area, we'll save that. And then what we should see in here is once I run it, then it'll actually tell me that it's time stamped. So we'll go ahead and run it and we'll watch for that. So we should get the camera, we're good there. And so what we're seeing in real time are the frames now being accessible to us through this delegate method with the exact time. So what you should roughly see here is about, you'll notice that the seconds kind of change every so often, 52, 53. You should be getting about 30 of those at a time. Of course, the date, the, the year, the month, the date, the hour, the minute, that's not gonna change. I mean, except when it does change, but as we're kind of operating here on a very fast frequency, you're seeing about 30 of those come across because I can capture about 30 frames per second. So that's great. We have a delegate method that's going to get us access to the uh, to this to the specific uh, data frames that are coming from the camera right now. That's perfect. So now we've got a a project and uh, going and a console result that's going, and we know that the capture out function can do some work with us for us. Um, but we're going to put it to use for handling the data that's coming from the camera frames we now have access to. And we can go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and stop this. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, we'll just comment this out because we're going to have to add a few more things in here to our delegate method. And we've got four steps that we need to add in here. They're not super long, um, but we'll get them in there because I want to get into being able to do the model. So the first step, our step one, now that we have access to the data is to get the image data in the sample buffer. And we're going to do that with a CV pixel buffer. That's our image buffer that holds the pixels that are in the image in the main memory of the device. So we'll do a guard let my pixel buffer and we'll specify that as a CV pixel buffer. It's just a type of object that we're dealing with there. And that's going to be a CM sample buffer get image data. And that's going to be our sample buffer that we have already have coming. And I actually think that is. CM sample buffer get image buffer. Yeah. And then that might be, yeah, CM and then sample, 
sample buffer. Yeah, I think that's right. Oh, hold on a second. We'll see if that works for us. Nope. Oh, wait. oh, that's a little foolish on my part. Because I guarded it initially thinking ahead. So we have a CM sample buffer. Uh, I'll double check that. I didn't think that that was the CM sample buffer get image buffer. I didn't think this part was necessary. Yeah. Okay. And it's going to say, well, it's not used. Okay. Sometimes you can be correct and it tries to fool you. So step two, we're going to define the model you wish to use on the data. Okay, well, now we're going to talk about models. So the two that I talked about were SqueezeNet and ResNet 50. Now I don't have any models over here on the left. You don't see any, but if I went over to, if I just Googled in Apple machine learning models, then you basically can go into this session here and um, page to the, what is it? Developer.apple.com machine learning models. Or if you just Google Apple machine learning models, it'll land you in to the core ML models page that Apple, where Apple provides the models. And so there's a ton here. And most of these are probably look familiar to you if you do this kind of, uh, of machine learning models. We've got YOLO v3, YOLO v3 tiny. Uh, if you were doing pose estimations of people. So like these are all models trained to do different things. A couple that I've grabbed were SqueezeNet. So it's a pretty small scale architecture. And uh, then I got ResNet 50. And what we'll find is ResNet 50, what it does is it looks for objects in the video as it's coming across. And it gives you a certain like in best list with a certain probability. And if you were to click on any of these, like let's say ResNet 50, uh, it would give you, for example, machine learning models, different weights, different, you know, I'm using a 32 bit, you might want a, an eight, a 16 bit or an eight bit. And you'll see these are reflective of different sizes of model and it's just how they were developed and saved. And so for me, for me, the example I've got down here is just the 102 megabyte one and I downloaded it and that's what's on my desktop here. So uh, you could certainly, you know, get into SqueezeNet and all those great kinds of things and download the similar type of stuff. I'm just using the 32 bit because it was the first thing on the list, but you could use any of these or you could use CoreML, which is Apple's development kit to be able to do that or use YOLO v3. A lot of people use that or use the small version of YOLO v3. Uh, you do get into accuracy problems. Um, but in all likelihood, you'll be, you'll be most likely to probably train your own classifier. And so um, I'll put some resources in there for how to train a model. I'm not training a model today because sometimes that can take hours or days to do it. So I'm just having them available and showing you where you can get them. So that's where the machine learning model comes down in a .ml model format. And all you do is take the model file and you just drag it into your project like this. And that is the extent that of effort that you have to do to get a machine learning model in an iOS application. Um, we could put more than one, we'll just, we'll just deal with one for right now. Uh, but we are, we are about to start referencing it here in step two. So that's why we needed it in there. So we want to define the model that we want to use on the data. So let's go ahead and specify our model. So we'll do a guard, let my model. And we'll go ahead and try to make sure. I mean, it might not be there. I might have not dragged it in there. So we'll do the co code on this VN core ML model. And it'll, it'll uh, then... to go ahead and specify the model. And in our case, uh, I'm using, what did I pull in? ResNet 50, yeah, ResNet 50. 
And then I need to go ahead and type model to finish it out. And if it weren't there, then what I would just need to do is return, return that. So that's that's basically our step two or four that we need to do to get that going. So um, we have two more steps here for this one. So step three, we're going to define a request for the model. And in doing so, we'll just say let my request. And we'll set that equal to a VM, uh, VN core ML request. A VML core and VN core ML request is a, it's an image analysis request that uses a core ML model to go ahead and process the images. And we'll specify, you know, we already said it was my model. So there's that. And so what we'll do here is, is uh, uh, go ahead and print out the result of that model request or request from the model. So let's go ahead and open up a little scope to this. And then we'll put in a uh, print. Uh, we're gonna, we wanna look at the results. So finished q.results. And what this is gonna do is gives results print out. All right, let's see, what are we missing? Finished request in scope, I think that's okay. Oh, sorry, I missed a piece of that. Finished request error in. All right, so now that should go away. And it's just gonna tell me that I haven't finished it now. All right, and then we have one more thing. We wanna facilitate the request from the model. Now that we've defined the request for the model, the request from the model. And so here we're gonna use a VN image request handler. That's just an object that processes one or more image analysis requests that we've already specified pertaining to a single image. So in that case, we're actually just gonna do a try VN image request handler. And we're going to be getting that from my pixel buffer. So we do a CV pixel buffer. And we got my pixel bar. See, it almost writes itself. And then options, we've got, we'll do a close out on that. And then we'll do a perform. And then uh, the request is my request. Um, to be perfectly honest, as you know, as I myself over the years have tried to learn a lot of stuff that Apple does, um, a lot of times I just go by the documentation. I, you know, I don't make the code, so I wouldn't have necessarily put it together in this type of format. But a lot of this comes out of the Apple Developer documentation. And, you know, it's just been learned through examples and stuff like that. So if some of this seems like it's very, very weird, I don't disagree. Um, it, it's just, uh, it, it, that's why I wanted to share it with you today, because I wouldn't have necessarily known how to do all this from scratch. And so that's, um, my guess is maybe not you either. And so showing you this is, is one of those important things. All right, so now we should, in theory, because we're printing out our results list, be able to go ahead and run this and see some results data from our model coming across here. All right, uh, let's see, what do we got? Yeah, so what we see here 
it's a lot coming by and it's all, we've not parsed it yet, but what we see in here, oh, I guess I don't have the camera up, but you know, maybe I'll see something like a monitor or something of that nature. Until I slow it down, until I select the top results, you're just gonna see the raw data feed coming from the device itself. So this is processing each of the camera frames. We know we were capturing each of them. This was processing the capture frames uh, as they're coming through and they were processing it through ResNet 50. And it's giving us like an end best list of results, but let's drill down just a little bit more to get that. Because what we'd like to do is we'd like to pull up some images of some different objects or animals or so on and so forth on our, our device there. And, and my apologies for all the little messages coming across. I have turned that off and silenced that on my phone. Not sure why it's still showing it, but um, all right. So we've got all that and, and all the results are there in our, our our uh, VN, classific or, yeah, VN classification observation objects. And what this is, is everything that you're kind of seeing here is the, it's, it's this object that represents the classification information that the analysis request itself that we specified my request uh, produces. So we're just getting the whole everything. And so what we'd like to do is really grab those results that we're seeing coming across and get the single top result for what the model determines is the most likely object in the video coming from the camera. And we can do that by only adding two lines to uh, of new code after our print statement and so what we're going to do is, uh, and that's where we do our VN core ML request. We're going to add it there. So let's go ahead and, and, uh, and put that right after our print statement is probably the easiest thing. We'll do it in our, in our request there. So we're going to do a guard, let my result, my results equal finished requests results as and we said we're going to do it as a vn classification observation and then uh, since we're guarding if we don't get that then we'll return it and we need to add uh, one more line of code because we want the first observation So this is going to come out of my results first. And if we don't get that, then we'll just return. OK. And what we can do is then we can add a print statement along, along with these lines of code to check that, that, in fact, we're getting the top results. So, so I said two lines, but let's just go ahead and put in a print statement so we can see that in the console. So my first observation, and we want the identifier, that's gonna be the, the name of the object that's coming out of ResNet. And then my first observation dot confidence, and that's gonna be the confidence that that observation comes along with. So we'll save that and we're gonna run it. And maybe what I'll do is do some, I mean, what, what I got pulled up here, oh, I got bananas. Okay, so I'll just look at bananas. We'll see if bananas is in ResNet 5, I think it is. So let's go ahead and run that. Uh, you know, we could certainly switch around to animals and look at that, but we'll just, in the interest of time, make sure that we see that here. So we should see the camera pull up and we should see in a console, that is not giving me the first observation. What did I do not correctly there? That should be giving me the first observation. Not really sure why that's not giving me the first observation. Let's see, is there anything quickly I can fix? No, that's all correct. 
That's all correct. So we're getting the whole thing. You can see here it was looking, but for some reason that's not pulling up. The single top result, um, I will definitely look at, take a look at that in the code. That sure was working this morning when I tried it. In any case, um, what this should have done was give you the, the single top result here uh, from all of this data. And you could see that, you know, maybe there was obviously some, some miscorrected classifications that were going on here, things like bullfrogs and, you know, brown bears. And I've got some animals behind this thing that uh, are up on a bulletin board and it might've been seeing that, but um, yeah, let's see what's going on in the chat. I think, oh yeah, comment out the first, oh yeah, there we go. All right, I'm glad I got helpers here. You're right. And I even had that in my notes, consequence of doing a full day of this stuff. Okay, let's try it again. And maybe then that gets it around a little bit better. Okay. So let's see if we can get bananas and dogs and cows and, and all of that stuff. So we'll see if it comes up. Let's see. Oh, hooray. It works. Let's see if we can do, let's see if we can do like cows so that we can see that pull up some images here. One thing to note when you're doing some of these models is, uh, that's not right. And it may not have been trained on these particular animals. So yeah. So it only knows what it's been trained to do. So I know for you know dogs, I think there's dogs in there. For this particular model that I dragged in, you know, it, it knows what it knows. Yeah, so those dogs, pugs, Pekingese, different kind of dogs, things like that. So that's what you see coming across. And if you had your model trained on specifically like pigs, then you know you could have that. I, I do have one that's trained on pigs, but one thing that I want to mention is that you also have to train with images of the correct resolution that you're going to be looking for. So if the pigs are small and the image is coming across, like if your camera's far away, it might not find them because you might have used images of pigs that were like right up in their face. And so having a, at least the variation or the appropriate level of resolution of the image that has been trained will make a difference. And so that's why some of those pictures of dogs picked up, that's why some bananas, but if I had really small pictures of fruit and things like that, it might've not picked it up. And we'll, we'll see that here when we uh, look at a, an object detector. So um, what, what I can do is um, you, we, could dis, we could have this printed on the, on the screen itself. Uh, there's a way to do that. And I have uh, programmatically the way to do labels and to change the text of the label so that you would see what you see here in the console also display on the screen. I think probably in the interest of time, because there's a couple of more things that I want to show you is uh, I'll just include that in the, in the, the post-game notes and it, you can just copy and paste it into your code without me having to sort of like type it all from, from scratch. Um, but I did wanna show a couple of more things. Uh, one thing I wanted to show is that's fine for like a single object, but what happens if you've got, uh, you where you wanna do characterization across multiple uh, like or multiple instances at the same time, the the code that I showed you would only really do kind of one an, one animal or one object in the image at a time. But let's go ahead and open uh, another Xcode project that I have that that's actually downloaded from the Apple developer. Now that you know how to all this stuff works with the camera and capturing images and getting the model applied and things like that. Uh, you could move on to something like some of the code, some of the stock code that comes with Apple. And one of those is the being able to recognize objects is in live capture. Now, if you just dove into this without seeing any of this other stuff or hearing these other things, this can get like extremely complicated when they start adding some extra functions that'll do things like put these little rectangles and the labels, how you can see here, like that it's a banana and the confidence. So whereas we were just displaying something to the console and without a lot, a whole lot more effort, we could put it on a label on the screen to have multiple objects all in the same time 
uh, gets a little bit more complicated. So, but I want to take a look at that to show you how that would look in a little bit more polished way than what we've just built here together. So if I just go into this, this is called um, the Breakfast Finder app. And so it looks for things like eggs and croissants and bananas and all of that. But if you look into the viewer controller code, you'll see a lot of, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but we've still got our preview layers. And from the recognizer, um, you know, a lot of what you see in here in this code is like draw, drawing layers, that layers that would sit on top of where the camera is seeing. And, but you've still got AV capture sessions, AV capture outputs, all that kind of stuff and CM sample buffers. And those types of things, what I do need to do is to change the signing to me so that it would actually compile to my device. So what I'll do is I've got this set up to be in my, um, on my iOS device. So I've got that and I'm gonna go ahead and do it. So we're doing kind of the same thing that I was showing, but we're gonna do it in a multi multiple object uh, capacity. So let's go ahead and bring over And yes, so let's do it here. And you'll see that if I play around with the resolution of the images, a couple of things happen. One, you start to see it and then you don't, right? You'll see these all kind of flashing at the same time. And this is really no different than what we ourselves were doing. It's just polished up a lot more on the interface, but it's the same kind of label returns and it's the same kind of confidence intervals and stuff like that. And as we scroll down, you'll see all these kinds of things. So this is actually a model uh, and we can, we can double check it, but it's looking for things like fruit. Uh, it'll do things like eggs and oranges and coffee. And as you can see, like it'll get them all at the same time and all that kind of stuff. So you can imagine if you had trained your model for something like pigs and you look at a pen of pigs and then boom, they're all you know, right there and so on and so forth. So what we can look at here is the, the, uh, the ML model. So they have a custom object detector trained here that if we previewed into it, I think we should be able to preview into it. And so there's a software that you can run uh, that's called Core ML. And it is in, oh, sorry, it's CreateML, CreateML. So that's the software that comes along with Xcode, which would let you create, you know, a mod, let's say a, um, a new project. You could do, do things like image classification, object detection. This is all really built in. If you did text classification, all that. I'll cancel out of it, but it allows you to go in in the in the similar way that if you use, let's say, RoboFlow, or even if you trained your own model on your own computer. I will tell you that if you use Apple's ML, Create ML, it's going to be more optimized for what you're going to do. And Apple gives you two variations that you can do that. You can do it in Yolo V3, and you can use transfer learning. And you wouldn't think that it would. Uh, so, for example, this one was trained on Yolo V3. And, you know, I think that there was maybe, yeah, so you could drag preview images in here to see how effective the model worked. It would allow you to look at predictions and different things like that. The size of the image that we talk about that being important, expectations and such. But if I had a whole directory full of images that I wanted to just give it a whirl without even doing anything to see if it worked by just selecting that without actually even being in CreateML, you could do the same thing in CreateML it allows you to do, but this model has been optimized to run on iOS in your app to do that type of detection in real time. If I had taken a YOLO V5 or even a YOLO V3, it would work probably, but it may not be optimal for running at the speeds to do real time in here. So that's being able to do objects detections in real time. Uh, and that's just a little bit different variation. But now you know how to do all the things under the hood to get the camera into a view, to get data from the camera, to manipulate it, to apply the model and know where you can get models from and how to bring them into there. And those models can be of anything. Uh, as we've seen, it works with dogs or bananas or livestock or, or, or any of those kinds of things. And that's where we've applied them to. Um, 
there, the one other thing that I wanted to show you, and what I'll probably do is just go uh, do, do my own very recording of that is, what happens if we wanna do a cross platform? This works great for iOS, but it would not obviously work for Android. Now you might say, well, that, that seems very limiting. And to some extent it is, but you could, you could do it and we could use something that's called Unity. Now in Unity, so you, is, it's really a game development device. I've got a couple of applications pulled up here that you could take a look at and I can go ahead and run them to show you effectively what they do. And we'll try to do the YOLO detection on this one. But there's a couple of templates that I'll be able to share with you. One is just the camera template that um, there's, there's kind of some process in here to getting this set up, but I can include that with the instructions. Um, if we wanted to go ahead and play this, this is kind of similar to the storyboarding type thing that we were doing with, with iOS. And if we make this, then I can compile it for either um, Android or iOS, as we would see here, if I go into the build settings for, let's say, this template that we want to do, I could build software in here that would work on anything, PlayStation, Xbox, PCs, Linux, all that kind of stuff. So you could build and run for that. Um, and, and that's how I can get similar things over to Android. But what, let's, let's take a look and see. Um, so I've got the Unity set up in exactly the same way, kind of the instructions that were online. And I've got that open CV, the computer vision part processed. Um, if, if we look kind of under the hood, so this is the storyboard version of it, which I don't think will be too difficult when you see it. But if you look into the code, you know, this is a lot of the code that's behind doing something like, displaying the camera and getting something to work. So you can see it's a little bit more involved and we can go ahead and run this and we can get something as simple as it should, actually it should, unlike iOS, it should give me access to my web camera. So there I am again, and oh, actually I'm running YOLO. So I have it set up to do some, some, some object detection, some facial detection, some things like that. So it is picking up those things in, in somewhat of a real time. Uh, there are some things to think, and now I'm getting creeped out by watching myself get recognized here. So um, there are some things that I will share with you about different configuration settings in here. So for example, if you wanted to try it, if you had a different YOLO uh, uh, model, let's say YOLO Vivor Tiny, you could change those settings. And that's how, for example, you would get a different model in here. Let's say you didn't really have to change anything. Uh, but maybe just the model. So if you have a temp this template that I'm going to give you, you don't really have to do anything except change out the model. But if you wanted to pass that information around between scenes, let's say, for example, between different screens, then it would be, um, you know, you would just create more of these templates. This doesn't lock you into doing any kind of um, a, a specific phone or anything like that. Um, uh, so we'll keep it in the game right now. What else do I want to tell you about this? Um, but yeah, so I have a, a webcam template version of this and then one that you could put different models in. Let's see, let's, let's go ahead and just crash it to the ground here. Um, I think we could put in mobile.net SSD underscore deploy. So I think we could put that in there and see how that would perform. But basically in, in the context of Unity, you wanna think about it as in like creating storyboards and then you have the codes that sit behind that that you may or may not do anything with it, but primarily more like properties you can develop. Um, the problem is, let's see, what can we do? Mobile net, let's try it. Let's try it with mobile net SSD underscore deploy. Then we would do the same thing. We need to specify the configuration file. So it seems easier until you have to do other things with it and then not easier. And I have to double check on if I needed to change that one or not. Um, let's see if that works. So let's see if that gives an error. But once you have sort of these templates build up that you really, you have, you can kind of, you have to do less 
yeah either there's things not in the objects yeah there's there's nothing in there that and there's nothing in the scene that's recognizable by the classes that are as part of that but um if that were the case then you would see other objects detecting and we can do things we have some functionality that are built in like flipping the camera around like there's obviously no like that was pulling my camera um you could snap still photos um moral of the story is is that every frame that's coming in here is getting passed through that model that we specified there and then you you know some result or something like that it comes from it in a similar way but these models that I'm using are extremely lightweight. They're like four megabytes a piece and they work fast. And if we if we put even something like, I can't use the same model that was developed for iOS in this one, just not swappably, you know, that's one problem. But if I put a, like a hundred megabyte model in there, you would be, you would get like one frame per second. And that would be a, a complicated thing. And so what I'll do is I'll, you know, I think the main thing was I wanted to, you to see how to, to to build out an iOS app that you could get access to the data that you could then start playing around with your own models and be able to do stuff in real time that you could look at sample Apple to code and know what the heck they're talking about and that there are options here for cross-platform development and I could I could go into here and build and run I could take this I don't I'm not going to do it right now because I'd have to switch it over but I could go in here into our build settings you could build and run and it'll deploy to the phone just like the other one. Um, just realize that kind of the big difference is, is that the way that you would construct the interface, the type of the code that you're dealing with, the size of the models are going to matter. I can run much bigger models on iOS. Um, and uh, the deployment is different. So you would deploy through either test flight directly on an offload like out of Xcode or you would do it through the App Store. The one advantage that Android apps give you is that you need to do, you can do side loading. So what will happen if you built this, and, and certainly, you know, we could do that real quick. So I'd switch it over to Android and we could switch our platform here. And just to show you for the sense of completeness here, and this is where it might take, if it takes more than a couple moments here, then I won't do it, but it has to switch the platform. And it goes through and it and it reinterprets the code and prepares everything and all of the deployment information that we've we've done through and it sets it up ready to do, save it as what's called an apk and android phones you can sideload so that if somebody creates an application you can give it to somebody else and they can just upload it to their phone that is not how it works with ios at all unless you're doing local deployments you could do it through test flight but it's very regulated is not really the right word but it is very protected and so um, that's that's something to keep in mind so when i work with people we often have the the setup so uh anyway so what i'll do is and i'll come back to those so the last thing here is you could just do a build and run and everything we see and then you could save it as you know a name where you want to save it and it would save it basically as a dot apk file that then you could offload to something but i'll give you all this stuff but once you have it then you know how to compile it based on what i've what i've shown you so seems like we're kind of bumping up right to there to the to the five o'clock um i know there's a lot more to probably go through i'm happy to share all that with you but now you know at least how to get on ios and to do some of the similar things in android so where i would encourage you is to think about ways in which you could um, if you've been building models, now you know how to deal with them in I mobile applications, and you can just go and test them out. So I think that's a good position to be in. All right, so let me go ahead and stop this share, and I'm happy to stick around and, and answer any questions. I know that there was some coming across here, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, sorry about that. If you didn't, if you were sending me uh, direct message chats and you didn't want anybody to see that, oops. Um, so okay yep thank you thank you so much josh um for this presentation and for leading this workshop really great stuff hopefully yeah. people are going to be inspired to go and start uh collecting some of their own data um using this pretty um uh, convenient way of collecting data if, if there's any questions um please do feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask we're a small group at this point um 
So I don't think you need to worry about entering anything to chat. Yeah, sure. Yeah, please drop anything in there. It looks like people are kind of just dropping their contact information. So, um, but yeah, happy to take any questions or answer anything that might be related to some, any of the programming that we did, especially on the iOS. Some of that I went through a little fast, but but I will upload all the code where um, probably to my repository, and then that link can be linked with the the video as well. And what I'll probably do on that second one is. I, uh, I did have some things written up for what I wanted to do on the Unity where I went into a little bit detail about how you would create that scene that I showed you. I was I don't do the code, but but uh, you can see that as well. Okay, great. I will get that link from you then, Josh, and we will add that to the website and okay. we'll have it right there with the recording uh, so folks can access that uh, at their convenience. So thank you so much again for a great workshop. Um, Perfect. Glad to be with well. you and happy to answer questions anytime. All right. Thank you. Take care. All right. See ya.